Thank you very much for coming. Good to see you all here, particularly when you have rooms where you can go elsewhere. So thanks very much for picking me. I guess you know we're going to talk about the dynamic duo for reversing heart disease today. And uh, try to show you that high, high doses of vitamin C and high doses of glycine can not only reverse heart disease, but can prevent it. When I was a student at the Harvard Medical School, it may surprise you to know that Paul Dudley White, who was the professor of medicine at Harvard, told our, told our class that when he was an intern at Harvard at Massachusetts General Hospital, that it was rare, rare, rare to find a case of heart attack. Didn't, they didn't come in. So you, you would think that would be, when you look at day, today's society, um, so many heart attacks, but in those days it was rare. In fact, it was so rare that when a case came into the Massachusetts General Hospital, they used to put on a call to all the other doctors, come on down and see it. Because if they didn't come and see it, maybe weeks and weeks would go by before they, they'd have another case. Today, today, every 20 seconds, a heart attack occurs in North America. Every 37 seconds, somebody dies. While you're sitting here today, for the next hour, it won't be an hour, but if, if you're sitting here for an hour, your heart would beat 4,000 times. And in the next 24 hours, your heart would beat 100,000 times. If you happen to live to 70 years of age, your heart would beat 2.5 billion times. I'm way over that limit. Here's the color. <laughs> That's why we have 500,000 bypass operations done a year. Why half of the population are going to die of a coronary attack or, or a cardiovascular disease. Now why does it happen? The main reason it happens, people are dying of cardiovascular disease and heart attacks today because basically a, a lousy lifestyle. People are getting obese, we have an epidemic of, of, of obesity, which leads to an epidemic of diabetes. 90%, 90% of, of patients who have type 2 diabetes are obese. When I was at Harvard Medical School 67 years ago, 10% were, were obese. In other words, in a generation, we've gone from 10% to 9%. In other words, Society is doing a pretty lousy job of keeping us normal weight. Ask the person on the street, why, why, are, why are coronary attacks occurring? What do you think they're gonna tell me? What would they, what would they tell me? High cholesterol, okay? If you have high cholesterol, you have to take cholesterol-lowering drugs. Family doctors, the person on the street, all believe that High blood cholesterol causes heart attacks. Even cardiologists believe it. Why do they believe it? Because the pharmaceutical companies are making billions and billions of dollars selling those drugs. And if you had an industry that was making billions of dollars a year, you would protect your turf. And you protect your turf by spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year to convince me as a doctor you as a layperson and cardiologist, that this is what they should, should do. The great problem is, I, I, I can understand how the laity, you don't, you, don't, you don't have the means to really counteract that, that kind of advertising. You know, lots of dollars, lots of dollars. And family doctors who are uh, doing so many different things. You can't really expect your family doctor to know everything that goes on in every particular field of medicine. But the people that I really, and the doctors that I, I say can be severely criticized, 
for the cardiologists who should know better. And they should start saying, look, <coughs> you can shoot holes, you can shoot that cholesterol theory down in flames when you go into great detail. Years ago, and years ago, I wrote in my column that half the people who have a coronary attack have normal blood cholesterol. Now, you would think cardiologists would say, you know, something else is going on. There was a research study done in, in, in Finland about 10 years ago, and it showed that if you had a high fibrinogen content of your blood, fibrinogen is a, is a small particle in the blood that reacts with other particles to form a blood clot. And if you had <coughs> elevated fibrinogen, you were five times more likely to have a coronary. But we have no way of lowering fibrinogen. And even if they could, it might be hard to pack so they wouldn't make any money. So that the, there are so many, in this, there are so many discrepancies. For instance, of Japanese who live in Japan and Japanese who live in California have exactly the same blood cholesterol levels. But the Japanese living in California, you might guess, have higher incidence of cardiac attack. Why? Maybe the super highways in California do it. If you take the same segment of people living in Sweden, another living in Edinburgh, Scotland, people in Edinburgh, Scotland have a 3%, three percent, three times the, the percent, three times the rate of a, a, a heart attack. Now why is it? Is it that they are in northern Scotland and they're not eating enough veggies? Maybe not, not drinking enough of their scotch. <laughs> <laughs> they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't taking Sir William Oyster's advice. That, that, that milk is for, the, the alcohol is for the elderly, but milk is for the young. <laughs> Oyster was a very wise guy. And I, I, I've never tried to dispute that theory. So I always have a drink with my wife at five o'clock. Because uh, I'm sure he's right. <laughs> it, was a, it was extremely, uh, rather interesting. Just dive first for a moment. We're, we're, we're getting into the flu season. You know, a lot of you will be running to the, to the store and getting the usual things they treat sinusitis or cold. It's all junk. You know, you're really, it's all junk stuff. Osler had the right idea. He said, you go to bed. You put your hat in the bedpost. You start drinking whiskey. <laughs> a little more whiskey. And when you see two hats, you stop. <laughs> the great problem with having a closed mind like cardiologists is that it causes a lot of trouble. I am totally convinced that in the next decade, a lot of people are going to die of a coronary attack because they are not, they are misled into taking cholesterol lowering drugs, which are, mm. I think, extremely hazardous. <coughs> the, uh, the great danger is that not only are you misled in terms of, of, of patient care, but looking at history, it's, it's caused a hell of a lot of trouble. For example, when the first, uh, uh, <coughs> when, the, when the obstetrical hospital in Vienna was open, about 1750, one woman in six who went in to have a child, how do you think she came out? Yeah. Didn't come out, didn't come out with a newborn baby, all dressed up in her little blue or what was it, blue or pink, pink, black, she came out in a coffin. And the reason she came out in a coffin is because Semmelweis, and this was long, long before the germ theory was known, decided that one, what would happen if I washed my hands in a very weak antiseptic solution? And so he did it. And all of a sudden, on his ward, the death rate went down like that. When Semmelweis mentioned this to his colleagues, they were all eminent professors at the University of Vienna, obviously bright, bright people, they didn't say, well, that's a great idea. We'll go and wash our hands and do the same thing. What they did was ridicule him. They literally ridiculed him to such an extent 
and they drove him out of the university. He had to go in the private practice in Vienna. He became very depressed. He finally ended up in the pink insane asylum and died. Terrible, terrible tragedy. Those doctors, more than likely, I don't think today they would be accused of malpractice. They would be accused of murder. And, and if, if the doctor, if, if litigation lawyers knew that on one ward, just because of washing your hands, they were saving patients, yet if litigation lawyers lined up for a mile to take on that case. Take the case of Louis uh, Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was an eminent uh, French scientist, and he had the audacity to say to the French Academy of Medicine that germs cause disease. And he too was very true. Not a good idea to have a closed mind. Sometimes, you know, your, your mind can be so closed, so closed, you, you can't, can't get any new ideas. And these cardiologists are so convinced that the cholesterol, the be all and end all of cardiac attacks, that their mind is clouded up with that fact. Just take the example of, of uh, James Lynn. Uh, James Lynn was a, a, a naval surgeon, and people were dying of, of uh, scurvy. Bad, bad disease. Scurvy, <coughs> you, 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 you develop, you develop uh, muscular aches and pains. You uh, develop nausea and vomiting. Your teeth fall out. Why do your teeth fall out? Anybody got an idea? Because you don't have enough vitamin C. And it, you're not, it, your teeth aren't glued into your, into your gums. And finally, you bleed to death. Now, James Lynn decided, why don't, why don't we give a little lime juice and see whether this helps? So he gave lime juice to a select group of, sa of sailors and none to, to the others. The ones that got the lime juice lived. And what happened was Lynn went to the British Admiralty, told them what had happened, and it took them 60 <coughs> years, 60 more years before they would get lime juice. And in the meantime, sailors were dying of scurvy. Now, why am I here today? I always ask myself that question. And I guess the reason I'm here today is because all of a sudden, years ago, after writing several books for the laity, I decided I would try to write a syndicated medical column. And uh, that's what was interesting. I, I walked into the office of the Globe and Mail <coughs> one day and had, had the audacity. I don't know how I had the audacity to do it because I was married to an English major. And she knew, and I knew, that I'd never had one hour of training how to write. And when I wrote my first book, and I said, I came home one night, started writing in longhand, and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing a book. She burst out laughing. <laughs> you can't write a book because you don't know how to write. <laughs> nice to have it, I'm very appreciative wife. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the day I walked into the Goldman Mail, Three days later, he said, you can write for the Golden Mail. I'd like your copy. And that's when the real terror set in, real terror. And then I realized that, Lordy, I've got to write a column, 52 weeks a year, 700 words. And for the last 37 years, I've written a column, 52 weeks a year, never, never had a week off. And when people ask me, what is it like writing a syndicated medical column, I can only say it's like, living with a demanding nymphomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can tell you, there, there, there are some weeks when, I, when I'm sitting at a blank screen of the computer when I'd rather be married to the nymphomaniac. <laughs> at any rate, a bit of heaven and a bit of, a bit of hell in, in terms of writing medical college. While I was writing for the Globe and Mail, I also was asked to be senior editor of the Canadian Doctor, so I had that responsibility. But that was a good move because I, I convinced the, the uh, others at the at the magazine that why not why not 
Lakers, and we're sort of going down a bit. Why not try to revitalize it by, by interviewing important people? And so I uh, flew onto the deck of the USS Nimitz while I was sailing with the US Seventh Fleet, interviewed naval doctors at that time. That was an exciting time. I interviewed the Queen's surgeon in London. He was a great fellow, a lovely fellow. I had a great dinner with him. But I never did find out whether the Queen had menopausal flushes. <laughs> <laughs> and he wouldn't tell me whether the Queen had her used or drink a gin at night. <laughs> interviewed the discoverer of the AIDS virus in, in Paris. Politicians, lawyers. Uh, one time I interviewed a female prostitute. Normally I would uh, do one-on-one one -on -one interviews. But I thought it would be more prudent at that point to call the Toronto Police to tell them that I was going to be interviewing a prostitute <laughs> in the downtown hotel room. <laughs> and I thought it even more prudent that just in case the police screwed up a little bit, that I should take a female editor along with me, which I did. I had no desire to be, see the headlines, Gifford Jones caught in the downtown hotel room with a female prostitute. My editors wouldn't like it. My wife sure wouldn't. <laughs> anyway, it was very, very interesting to, to meet the variety of people. But the, the real star, the real star was this guy right here, Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, I interviewed Linus Pauling on two occasions. Uh, a, a most, most gracious man. Uh, and he told me the first time I interviewed him that there's a major difference between animals and humans, namely the a animals make vitamin C and humans don't. And he said that's the main reason that, that people are dying of increasing numbers of coronary heart attacks. Now the critics of Pauling said, come on, come on doctor, there aren't any more cases of scurvy in Canada, you know that, or in the United States. Pauling said you're right. But it only takes 10 milligrams of vitamin C to prevent scurvy. It takes four, five, six thousand milligrams of vitamin C to prevent coronary artery disease. Now why is that? The reason it is because collagen, which holds cells together, needs vitamin C to make good collagen. In other words, if you if you have poor collagen from inadequate amounts of vitamin C, you develop cracks between <coughs> the two, and that's where blood clot forms. In other words, if you have a, uh, you, uh, your house is built of bricks, you have mortar to hold the bricks together, lousy mortar, bricks fall apart, house falls down. Pauling, of course, received a lot of criticism from, from, from uh, doctors, and, and, and still, as you know, he's dead, but he, over his lifetime, he received a lot of, of criticism for what he was doing. He just didn't believe it. Anyway, when I interviewed Paul, Paul I, I thought, you know, that's very interesting, uh, but, uh, you, know, it, you know, so what? Um, about 10 years later, when I was in Singapore, uh, there was a doctor, Stevens, Stevens, who was there, and Stevens said, you know, I, 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 I talked with him following the, uh, uh, the, the lecture, and he said, of course, Pauling is right. Pauling is totally right. Poor collagen means you're going to have a heart attack because the collagen doesn't hold up. He said, in addition, when the heart beats, the coronary artery is in the center of the heart's muscle, and when it beats, big, big pressure in the coronary vessel. And remember, it beats 100,000 times every 24 hours. So eventually, if you don't have good collagen, it breaks down, you get a heart attack. So that was another interesting fact. And again, I thought about it and went on my way. But three years ago, I read in, a obscure, in an obscure medical journal there was a doctor, Sidney Bush, in, in Hull, England, We'd done a very interesting experiment. 
he was an uh, he was an optometrist, and he was he found that many of his patients who, having uh, been uh, fitted with contact lenses, would get infection <coughs> underneath the lens. He was a very avid reader, and he knew a lot about pollen. He said, "Why don't I, why don't I try giving patients large doses of vitamin C and lysine?" And the reason lysine, incidentally, you put steel rods in cement to make the cement stronger. You put lysine in the collagen to make it stronger too. And the, the, remember, the, these things I'm telling you today are not theory; they are fact. And the big difference between theory and fact. Theory may work, maybe not. If you have the facts, usually things work. So what he did, he gave patients 6,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 3,000 milligrams of lysine. But he did one other thing that he should be given the Nobel Prize for. He took a photomicrograph, a picture of the back part of the retina, the only part of the body where you can see arteries and veins. <coughs> no, nowhere else. And then, a year later, he took pictures again. And this is what he saw. I incidentally went to England with my son Bob, who was sitting in the back of the room. I took Bob because I thought, I wonder if, how a lay person would look at this too. And we could both see the ma major difference. There's an artery on the, right here, retinal artery that's nearly Plug, just nearly plugged right off. And here it is after three years later. Totally normal. Now the other night, how many of you saw Clinton? <laughs> At President Clinton when he, when he spoke before the convention. You didn't, none of you saw that? <laughs> he, 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 you know, whether you love him or hate him, no, he's a great speaker. But anyway, there were about three times during his talk he looked out at the audience and he pointed with his finger and he said, now this is very, very important and I want you to listen to this. And I, I, I won't point my finger at you, but I want all of you, that's the most important thing I'm going to say today. That is a normal retinal artery. And if, since the head is connected to the body, what goes on in the retinal arteries has got to go on in the coronary arteries. <coughs> fact. But anyway, what has happened? Bush, like Semmelweis and others, has been ridiculed by, uh, by uh, ophthalmologists. Maybe he's an optometrist, not an ophthalmologist, not a regular doctor. It's a terrible <laughs> distinction. It's a, what's a stupid distinction? Here's a guy who made a great discovery, and yet they're not listening to him. He should get the Nobel Prize. Really should. Anyway, af after that, happened. I was sitting one day, sitting at my desk writing a column, and I realized that, hey, you're having a heart attack. And I was having a heart attack. I, just to make sure, I got up and ran around a little bit just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to, I all remember Professor Harvey telling me that, if you ever have a pain, you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to be left with me, me, you know, have an area of habit. It was terrible, terrible timing. Terrible time because I was going to attend my son's wedding in Buenos Aires a week, a week later. Didn't make it. Anyway, I had a bad heart attack. Had a coronary bypass. And then my I had to make this terrible this, this, this decision. My doctor said, "You're a damn fool if you don't take you know cluster lowering drugs." And I can tell you something: doctors get damn mad. When patients don't do what they tell them to do. They even get damn mad when doctors don't do what they tell them For sure. Anyway, I had to do a lot of hard thinking. And when your own life is at stake, you do a, hard, a lot of hard thinking. And I recall the time when I was making rounds with the, with the chief of surgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital. There were about three other young doctors I were, where I was in fourth year medicine at that time. And he put an x ray up on the board of the lungs, with a little, little lesion like that in, in, in one lung. And he said, all of us, what are you going to do about it? What's the diagnosis? What's the treatment? We shuffled back and forth, and you know, well, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a cancer, Dr. Churchill, well, we better operate and take it out. 
I said, yeah, but I said, what was it? This woman is 75 years of age. Doesn't really look like a cancer. Suppose you operate on her and, and, uh, and it's not a malignancy. Poor dear, he died. So we went back and forth. And finally, he looked at all of us and he said, look, look, what would you do if it was your own mother? And you know, that's when the adrenaline gets going. And there have been many times since when I've been doing surgery and I've had a decision like that, should I or should I not operate? I always have myself, what would I do if it was my own mother? So I asked myself, what would I do if my own mother, or what would I do if it was me? I don't want to die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided not to take cholesterol-lowering drugs. And I'll tell you why. Leonardo da Vinci was a very wise man and several centuries ago. He said, nature never breaks her own laws. Really what he was saying, don't, don't mess around with nature. He's been doing it a long, long time. He's got it more than likely all figured out. And don't fool around with it because there are unintended consequences. For example, I knew then that every cell in the body needed cholesterol. We would die without cholesterol. It's in every cell membrane. Manufactures vitamin D, manufactures the sex hormones, manufactures another, a lot of things. It's in about 200 metabolic processes. There's another important thing about uh, cholesterol is that it's in the brain. 20% of all the cholesterol we have is in our brain. There's another important point that President Clinton would say, we sure you listen to this. <laughs> it goes through the blood-brain barrier. In other words, all, of that, all the cholesterol drugs get through the blood-brain barrier to the brain. Not all drugs do, as you know, but cholesterol does. <laughs> so if it's doing it, if cholesterol is having, or if cholesterol-lowering drugs are having such an effect on the, the other parts of the body, the cholesterol in it, all the parts of the body. What's it doing to the brain? And we know that patients who are on cholesterol-lowering drugs have increased risk of suicide. More car accidents, maybe because something happened to the brain. We know that they have a greater incidence of type 2 diabetes, have a greater cardiac dysfunction. We know that it lowers coenzyme Q10 up to 40%. And coenzyme 210 is the, the spark plug of, the, uh, of, our, of our heart. Just by taking gas away from the car, it doesn't work very well. And I think maybe some authorities are right that say that in the, in the years ahead, we're going to have a, a high rate of congestive heart failure because the heart is being rubbed and rubbed at the very thing that, that it needs. The best case scenario that I have heard regarding this problem is Dr. Duane Greenland. And I've had a, a lot of correspondence over the last 10 years with, with this doctor. He was not only a doctor, but he was also a, an astronaut. So he had two things going for himself. He had a good mind, a bright guy, and of course he was in superb physical condition. But one day, during a, during a NASA checkup, he was found to have high blood cholesterol. And immediately the doctors put him on 10 milligrams of Lipitor. Three months later, three months later, he arrived home. Didn't know his wife, didn't know his children. Total amnesia. NASA doctor said, no way that it could be caused by Lipitor, but they took him off Lipitor anyway. So a few months later, they couldn't resist putting him back on half the dose of Lipitor, five milligrams. And two months later, didn't know his wife again. He had transient global amnesia. And obviously, the doctor was not amused. Uh -huh. He quit NASA, went into private practice, and has now been writing several books on why not to take cholesterol-lowering drugs. <laughs> so that the, the, you know, the, the, the unintended consequence and there are many, many unintended consequences with this. So what have I been doing for the last 14 years? 
I can tell you, I've been swallowing tons of vitamin C in my sink. More than I need, believe me. More than I need. I do it with religious fervor. You know why? Just because of what I've told you, but because I'm a damn man, damn man, that after interviewing Linus Pauling, I hadn't quite then started taking the vitamin C. Don't move. I was going to make the same move, move, move twice. Why does it, the story of the the story of the cat that sat in the hot stove never did it again. But he also never sat in a cold one either. <laughs> anyway, I've been taking tons of this. and uh, But I don't like swallowing pills. You know, some people don't want to swallow one pill. I have to swallow you know, 20 pills or more to get what I need. And I've often wondered why, why, why is it that some pharmaceutical company cannot make a combination vitamin C and glycine powder. And it wasn't until I met Dean Parks, the preferred nutrition, God bless Dean Parks, uh, who said, I, I think I can, I can use, I, we can do it, we can do it. And he has done it, and it's called Medi C Plus. And that will be in the marketplace, I guess, about maybe two or three weeks from now. Now, it's now. It's now. It's now. It's now. now. So I no longer have to take all these pills. One scoop, one scoop of this gives you 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 1,300 milligrams of lysine. So for the average person trying to you know, live the good life with and not, not have a coronary attack, two scoops a day. You've had a coronary attack, three scoops a day is better. So, so that's many C. Now what, what will history say about what I'm saying today? I think history will say that never before in the history of medicine has so much money been wasted persuading so many unthinking cardiologists to treat so many people with ineffective and dangerous cholesterol-lowering drugs, resulting in needless heart attacks when vitamin C and lysine could have prevented them. I really believe, I may be wrong, I'm not Jesus Christ. And, and, uh, you know, um, and, you know, we know so far, so far, so good. Uh, Fourteen years, nothing has happened. The doctors have been wrong. But I also remember the story of the man who jumped off the Skyline Tower. Halfway down, he said, so far, so good. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow is my Waterloo. <laughs> but anyway, um, what we were really talking about today is preventive medicine. And, and to practice preventive medicine, not to get obese, not to get the kind of, of diseases you should never get. Always practice medicine, practice medicine. And the rule, the first rule is, is practice preventive medicine. The first rule is, is never forget rule number one. I stole that though. You know, know where I stole it from? Warren Buffett said, first rule, never, never, never lose capital. And the second rule is never, never forget rule number one. <laughs> Anyway, what I've been telling you today is, is uh, uh, what I believe in. I say I'm, I'm not uh, the Lord Almighty. But a lot of people won't like me for saying the name of the pharmaceutical company. And when I write a column about, uh, about cholesterol, I get letters from uh, emails, and, and my editors get them too. Fire the son of a gun. Fire the idiot. Did he ever graduate from medical school? <laughs> Sometimes things get even tougher, and they want to tell me what should be done by explaining what, what they suggested to President Clinton. And Clinton, as you know, had some problems. I guess you know what the problems he had. I don't have to explain that to you. And one day, feeling very, very depressed, Clinton got out of the White House without a Secret Service, and wandered around Washington, and all of a sudden, saw the National, uh, okay, National Heart uh, Gallery. He thought, I'll go in there and just look around. And so he walked into various rooms. And finally, he walked into the room where the presidents of uh, portraits of former presidents. And he walked up to the president of the portrait of George Washington. And he looked up and he was thinking to himself, what, what would his first president, I say, what would he do if, if he had this problem? Finally, a voice whispered to him, go to the people, go to the people, they will understand. He said, well, that's not a bad idea. I'll go to the people, they will understand. 
He walked along a little further to Thomas Jefferson, looked up and wondered what Jefferson would do. And once again, Jefferson whispered to him, go to the people, go to the people, they will understand. He said, of course they'll understand, but only human. But as he was just about to leave, he looked around and saw the portrait of Abraham Lincoln. He said, ah, Lincoln. Lincoln had the Civil War, all kinds of, all kinds of problems. What would Lincoln say to me? So he walked up to Lincoln's portrait and he thought, what, what, what should I do? And there was a booming voice, booming voice that said, go to the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Now remember, I, I, I guess my time is up, and, and uh, I'll just close by, by this story. Remember, I'm not your doctor, not your doctor. I don't want you to go and throw all your liberator out and then die of a heart attack. <laughs> it's going to happen anyway, but... <laughs> the nice thing, you can take medicine along with liberator, as far as I know, without any, any, any problems. But remember this. It's always good to get second advice. And that reminds me of another story of a man who had a hell of a fight with his wife. Just a terrible fight. And as he was storming out of the house, after calling her every name in the book, he said, look, after, after, after I called you all those other things, you are also a lousy, lousy, lousy lover. And he left. As men often do, they get guilty, and, and, and uh, he came back a couple of days later and walked into the house and walked upstairs in, into the bedroom and found his wife in bed with another man. She just looked up at him and said, Darling, I decided to get a second opinion. <laughs> so thank you for coming today. <laughs> <laughs>